Grace be unto you, dear friends, in Christ. And peace from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, and be with us in this space. Enlighten our fires. We ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, two things. First, the internet is creepy. And second, I'm going to be a grandmother. For the first time. I'm so excited. But what's the connection? Well, when I found out, I immediately started to shop for baby stuff on the internet, of course, mostly online. And soon, baby advertising and baby stories started popping up on every website I visited. It's so creepy. But I couldn't resist. One link took me to funny baby announcements. It seems people have unique ways to announce they're going to have a baby. The funniest are the bun in the oven ones. Couples put an actual bun in the oven. And then they ask their parents to open the oven, and it takes a while for the parents to get it. The daughter says, what is it? Mother, it's a bun. And where is it? In the oven. So mom, put it together. It's a bun. What do you want me to do with it? Do you want a sandwich? What? Mom, put it together. Bun, oven, still doesn't get us. They repeat the same routine a few times until finally the new grandparents put it together. And then they start screaming, of course, at the news. I doubt I would have got that either. I was really never good at connect the dots. In today's gospel, we hear the birth announcement of Jesus. When Mary, soon to be mother of Jesus, makes the announcement to her family, she needs no props. She hardly has to say a word. So let's back up a little and provide some framework. Last week, Pastor Chris talked about the story before this story. If you weren't here, well, you're just going to have to read the book. <laughs> I'm kidding. Remember, no, I'm not kidding about that, but I'll tell you it anyway. Remember, the angel Gabriel shocks the big Jesus out of Zechariah when he tells him his wife Elizabeth, way beyond her childbearing years, is going to have a baby. Zechariah doesn't believe him. So Gabriel silences him for the entire pregnancy. I don't know if the silence is punishment for Zechariah or a gift to Elizabeth. <laughs> Six months later then, Gabriel shows up at Mary's house and pretty much tells her the same thing. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. Mary's reaction is a little bit calmer than Zachariah's, questioning Gabriel at first, but quickly moving on and responding with a casual, here I am, servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. As an aside, Gabriel also informs Mary, she is not alone in this story, that her relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this, and she is in her sixth month. You see, because with God, nothing is impossible. So we catch up to today's gospel. The angel Gabriel barely gets a word out before Mary rushes to see Elizabeth. Luke doesn't say why, but we can imagine. Once she lets Gabriel's miraculous message sink in, I imagine she's freaking out of just a little. It's like, oh my God, what were you thinking? Perhaps she wants to see Elizabeth to compare notes, to see if their stories line up. 
Mary gets her answer. As soon as she walks in the, in the door of Zachariah and Elizabeth's home and says, hi, little John the Baptist starts break dancing in Elizabeth's womb. Yeah. Elizabeth confirms the story's truth. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed is she who believes what our Lord told her. Why is it the mother of my Lord comes to me? As soon as I heard your voice, John leaped for joy. Elizabeth's enthusiasm ignites Mary's before Mary even has a chance to dust the, dust the dirt off her sandals. She bursts into song, <clears throat> praising God for turning her entire world upside down. I don't know about you, but when I even get an inkling that God is about to turn my world upside down, the last thing I think about is singing. I think about running and hiding and finding excuses for why I'm not the right person for the job. But singing, not a chance. Last May at my ordination, my good friend, Pastor Deborah Samuelson, used Mary's story for the sermon. She thought it would be funny if she would play a little game comparing me to Mary, which was perfect, other than that little thing about being the mother of God. We are so much alike. Okay, so that's not true. But maybe you just need to stretch your minds a little bit on this one. Alike. Both of us were just hanging out, minding our own business, living somewhat comfortable lives when God comes completely out of left field and says, I don't know what you're planning on doing today or tomorrow or the rest of your life, but I don't, I don't think we're on the same page here. Have I got a job for you? Not alike. Mary was a little more receptive to her call. She took nine months. I took about nine years. God had to drag me kicking and screaming toward ordination. I don't have enough fingers to count the times I tried to just bail on the whole process. Today, I should be lounging on the beach somewhere and would be, but God, Pastor Chris, and several others formed a conspiracy, railroaded my plans. I didn't have a chance, and I didn't have a choice. Alike. Joy. Mary and I were both surprised by joy. Mary, the unknown girl from an unnamed family, from an unremarkable town, becomes an unwed mother in an unbelievable way, and will never be unknown again. Mary is overcome by joy, singing, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I get it. Been there, done that, got the shirt, and so much more. Joy gave me the courage to embrace God's completely unexpected, completely unreasonable, and completely unbending thinking. When I peel back all the busyness and craziness of serving God and serving this church and just reflect, the joy overwhelms me. Just as easily when I, I'm in the fullness in the, of the busyness and the craziness, the joy overwhelms me. Being here, hanging out with you, and hanging out with God, amazed that God brought us all together. Pure joy. I scarce can take it in. Joy is interesting. It's like happiness, but different. Happiness turns up where we'd expect it to, at a wedding or an engagement, a rewarding job, a nice vacation, being with family. 
Joy, though, is notoriously unpredictable. Joy is not dependent on positive condition. Joy comes to us at the strangest times, in the depths of despair and the heights of pleasure, when we're most lonely or when we're most fully embraced. The only condition essential for joy is the infallible presence of God. Joy erupts when we dwell in and experience the genuine presence of God. Self-abandonment frequently accompanies joy. I don't know which came first, but they feed each other. The more joy, the more self-abandonment. The more self-abandonment, the more joy. Ask anyone who serves others. Ask anyone who serves through cross or families moving forward or urban homeworks or youth mission trips or feed my starving children or home communion visitors or worship servants or funeral team or kid pack or all the little ways we serve our friends and our family and our neighbors. The joy we scarce can take it in. Poet and Nobel Prize winner Tagore says it this way, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. G Jesus frequently reminds us to save ourselves. We must lose ourselves. Mary loses her life. Mary gives her life, and Mary delivers life into a suffering world, and joy is born. Just like the miracle of a new baby, joy is a miracle of God's construct. God creates it, and once God get move, gets moving, it's best to just get out of the way. We just show up with self-abandonment. We show up. My hope for us today and every day is for God's joy to be born in each of us so we too might deliver life to a suffering world. Amen.